I'm Anna Bruchet. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University, um, and I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk um, to you guys and tell you a story about how we use transposon mediated forward genetic screens to identify cell intrinsic resistance um, path resistance. Uh, cell intrinsic resistance to emerging viral pathogens. Particularly, um, I, I study mostly Ebola virus, but um, in the process of looking for something that would allow us to resist Ebola virus, we also discovered something that allows us to resist SARS-CoV-2 just as the pandemic was starting to unfold. So um, I'm really excited to share this story with you guys today. Um, given that this is the uh, virus replication section, um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about how Ebola virus gets into the cell. Um, so Ebola virus um, attaches to the cell surface um, and binds um, attachment factors on the cell surface that are more or less nonspecific, um, which then leads to internalization and macropenocytosis of the Ebola virus particle. That gets internalized, um, and then the virus particle starts to get cleaved by cathepsins, which are low pH-dependent proteases that cleave back a heavily glycosylated immunoprotective domain on the Ebola virus glycoprotein, so that's the protein on the surface of the Ebola virion that allows for, for entry to occur. This cleavage event reveals a receptor binding site on the, the Ebola glycoprotein that then binds to the um, Ebola virus receptor in PC1, and this leads to a conformational rearrangement that triggers fusion and leads to the release of the genome into the cytoplasm, and then the subsequent steps of the virus life cycle can take place. Um, when I was a graduate student, my work was finding MPC1 as the Ebola virus receptor. So for my postdoc, when I was thinking about starting my postdoc, I was very interested in finding ways that cells can naturally resist this very complicated entry pathway, right? So are there ways that cells can kind of inhibit Ebola virus entry um, because it's a very uh, coordinated dance that allows for Ebola virus to get into cells? So the, the main question I had was, how do you kind of find an unknown? A good way of finding an unknown is to use a forward genetic screen. In this case, I joined Adam Lacey Holbert and Linda Stewart's lab to use a transposon um, mediated mutagenesis screening technique that they had just recently developed. Um, and this allows us to basically um, put payloads into mammalian cells that ha are designed um, to manipulate the genome in, in whatever way we see fit. In this particular case, what we do is we have um, piggyback, so in those blue arrows is the piggyback inverted repeats, and that flanks a pyramycin selection cassette, and then downstream of that is a CMV promoter that's constitutively active, along with a splice donor site. So the idea is that if it inserts um, upstream, so downstream of the promoter, but upstream of the start codon, the idea is, is that that'll lead to constitutive expression of the gene um, af, uh, from that CMV promoter. Um, in practicality, when they did a proof of concept screen with a paxitaxel resistance, what they saw was also if the um, gene inserts in the opposite orientation re relative to the, the gene, if the transposon inserts in the opposite orientation relative to the gene, or um, if it inserts um, into the uh, gene, what you see is you see down regulation of that gene. So it can both lead to overexpression and down regulation. It's important to note here that this is complementary to CRISPR screens. We're not going to completely turn off genes, but we can turn down genes. Um, and it's uh, completely dependent on the location and the orientation of the insertion site, uh, what it does to the adjacent genes. Um, so this is a nice technique because it allows you to um, turn on and off genes at random. Um, and it does it anywhere there's a TTAA site in the genome, which is about one every 256 base pairs. Um, so how do we actually do the transposon mutagenesis screening? Um, what we do is we start with a cell line. In our case, we're starting with U2OS cells, which are osteosarcoma cells that are particularly good at dying from Ebola virus infection. 
Um, and we take those cells and we mutagenize them using the transposon and the transposase. So we transfect in those two plasmids and select for um, integrants that have our transposon uh, using the pyromycin resistance cassette. We then take that library of mutagenized cells and we expose them to a selection pressure, usually a purifying selection pressure. In this case, we use um, a vesicular stomatitis virus that has been pseudotyped with the glycoprotein from Ebola virus. So the glycoprotein from VSV has been replaced with that of Ebola virus. So to the cell, the virus looks like Ebola. But to us and to our immune system, the, vi the virus mostly looks like VSV. So this makes it very safe to use in BSL-2, um, which is a normal lab environment. So we are able to do these experiments not using high containment, which is key. Um, and this is actually, as an aside, this is what is one of the vaccines um, that's used currently during Ebola virus outbreaks. So it's very safe for us to use. Um, so it's replication competent and it kills off any cells it infects. So we select those resistant cells, we um, isolate the DNA from those resistant cells, and we amplify the transposon genome junction, sequence that area of the genome, and then align um, our sequencing results to the human genome and identify candidates and um, genes in close proximity to those insertion sites. So what does the data actually look like when we get it out? Here you can see um, this is a, the, a representation of our, our um, sequencing data from a screen. So the outside is just individual chromosomes, and then the inner rings represent each individual library that was produced in this screen. There are eight individual libraries, and what we um, do, each of those little X uh, black marks represents an insertion site in the genome. So what you can see clearly is it's, we see insertion sites throughout the genome. And then what we ultimately do is look for um, regions of the genome that have an increase in frequency of insertion sites. And that's highlighted by the orange bars. And then what we do to really be able to determine which are causative mutations and which are uh, bypasser or stand um, passenger mutations, what we do is we collapse all of the individual libraries into one large library using bioinformatics and then identify common insertion sites. So sites where um, insertions are increased over uh, random chance. So what you can see clearly here is that there are two sites in the genome that are um, that have um, a high representation of insertion sites. And these correlate to two different genes. The first gene is NPC1, which if you remember back about Ebola virus entry, that's the entry receptor. So this is really nice proof of concept that we can get virus host interactions out of this screen. And then the second um, factor that we found was C2TA. So when we zoom in on those insertion sites, what do they look like, right? So in C2TA, you see that the insertions are all downstream of the endogenous promoter, um, but upstream of at least one of the two start codons in this protein. Um, so all in the same orientation of the gene. So this suggests that it's a gain of function um, gene so that it leads to overexpression of that gene. Uh, importantly, it hasn't previously been implicated in Ebola virus infection. So what is C2TA? It ends up that it's actually the MHC class two transactivator protein. So it's a master regulator of MHC class two and other antigen processing proteins. It doesn't directly bind to DNA itself, but it coordinates a lot of transcription factors on that MHC class two gene locus and leads to the upregulation of MHC class two genes. Now, data I'm not going to show you here in the interest of time is that, you know, if we disrupt this transcriptional activity in any way, either knocking down the transcription factors or messing with the parts of C2TA that are responsible for this transcriptional activity, we see a complete loss of inhibition of our resistance phenotype. So, um, so importantly, it implicated to us that transcriptional activity is required for resistance. Um, and importantly, you know, when we express C2TA exogenously, we do indeed recapitulate this resistance phenotype. So we're not just relying on the screen data here, but we also see it when we re, um, recapitulate it um, exogenously or express it exogenously. Um, 
so the question we had was, okay, if this C2TA transcriptional activity is required, then what are the genes that are being upregulated? And uh, when we did an RNA-seq of C2TA expressing U2OS cells, which again, I'll remind you, are not immune cells. These are osteosarcoma cells. So we were like, maybe it's upregulating other genes. Who knows? These aren't immune cells. When we actually went in and looked at the genes that were being upregulated, only about 50 genes were upregulated, two genes were downregulated, and almost all of the genes were, genes were involved in MHC class II um, antigen processing. Um, importantly, no known Ebola host factors were up or down regulated. Um, so, you know, we were left with this question is, okay, this is quite curious because we're seeing a bunch of adaptive immune molecules um, getting upregulated in these cells that express C2TA, right? Um, but these cells are in tissue culture. There's not an adaptive immune response happening. So what's happening? So what this, this result suggests is that one of these proteins is leading to this resistance. At least one of these proteins, maybe a combination is leading to the resistance phenotype. So when we knock down each of these proteins individually, what we saw was that actually it was CD74 um, that was absolutely necessary for this resistance phenotype. So if we knock out CD74 and C2TA expressing cells, we don't get any resistance anymore. So it was really CD74 was accounting for this resistance phenotype, which leads me to the next question. What is CD74? Well, you might know it by its um, more uh, popular name, the invariant chain or L or II. So the invariant chain is the, the chain that's used to chaperone MHC class two from the ER as it's getting produced into the, um, the multifascicular body where the antigen processing happens. So it helps bind to, to the alpha and beta chain of MHC class two and helps it to um, get chaperoned to the late endosome lysosome where then the um, cleaved antigen peptides actually get get put onto that MHC class two, and then it gets taken to the surface and it does its adaptive immune thing. Um, but, you know, this MHC class two is really important for the transporting of, of these, these molecules to this compartment. But, you know, like anything in biology, you know, our, our initial undergraduate freshman immunology does not nearly describe all of the really interesting things that this protein can do, right? And there's so much more to it. So it's involved, in not, not only is it involved in this chaperone function, but it's also involved in cytokine signaling as a receptor for MIF. It has an internal fragment that can be a transcriptional regulator when it's freed by a membrane protease, which is kind of crazy. It regulates B cell maturation. And the most important for our purposes here today is that it has a role in regulating antigen processing by modulating proteases that are involved in that antigen processing um, pathway. And so that's very key. And remember that when we, we go on. Um, so how does it actually uh, regulate antigen processing? So one of the things we have to understand is that it also has many different isoforms. <laughs> so biology, I like to say biology is complicated and nothing is ever simple. So there's actually four different isoforms of CD74 in human cells. And these isoforms vary by either an alternative start, start site that leads to an ER retention signal um, shown in purple here, or an alternative splicing event that leads to an extra thyroglobulin domain added to the added to CD74, um, and that's shown in dark blue. And you know, each of these individual um, isoforms has a slightly different um, you know, phenotype and combination of these two things. So we had to test each individual isoform separately to really pinpoint what was accounting for this resistance phenotype. And what you can see here um, is that, you know, when we express P33 or any of the other isoforms, we don't see really uh, efficient uh, inhibition of entry or infection from, from Ebola VSV. But when we express P41, this isoform is both necessary and sufficient for 
this um, inhibition phenotype. So P41 is sufficient. Um, and that is on, the on, only the version that lacks the ER retention signal, but has that thyroglobin domain is important for this restriction phenotype, um, which really suggests that that thyroglobin domain and the ability to get into the late endosome lysosome is important for this restriction event. Um, so we kind of went back and dug through the literature to see if we could get some clues as to how exactly this is actually inhibiting um, Ebola virus entry. And what we saw was that all the way back in 1999, um, the, the P41 thyroglobulin domain was actually co-crystallized with Cathepsin L as a, a binder to Cathepsin L. Um, and here um, in green is the cathepsin L, and in pink is um, the P41 thyroglobulin domain. Um, in uh, yellow there is the um, active site of cathepsin L, and in the pink space-filled models are two particular uh, residues of P41, uh, proline and a glycine that, that help bind to the active site of um, cathepsin L. So we used this model to uh, design point mutations that would that we predicted would disrupt binding to P41, um, or disrupt the binding of P41 to cathepsin L, rather. Um, and what we saw was if we mutated it to either a positively charged arginine residues or negatively charged aspartic acid res residues, we saw an inhibition of this resistance uh, phenotype. So what you can see here is if we uh, mutate to arginine or um, aspartic acid, we get a complete loss of that restriction phenotype. However, if we mu mutate to a threonine, which is polar and neutral, we actually see that it doesn't really disrupt that restriction phenotype nearly as much. Uh, in the cathepsin binding site, abrogate inhibition, really suggesting that this cathepsin, this ability to bind and inhibit cathepsins is important for this resistance phenotype. So an important prediction of this model would be that if these um, viruses are unable to be processed by cathepsin L, then we would see an accumulation of these virus particles in the late endosome and lysosome of cells. So the question, next question we asked was, can we actually observe viruses trapped in these endosomal compartments, right? If we take cells that express um, either uh, P41 or C2TA, do we see a virus trapped in these cells? And indeed, this is what we see. So when we did electron microscopy to kind of look and see what's happening on, on the, the cellular level, um, what we saw was, you know, if we have U2OS cells that express that are control cells, we can see those endosomes um, with the multivesicular bodies shown by the arrowheads here. Um, and then if you have C2TA expressing cells, you actually see an increase in the number of endosomes and multivesicular bodies, which is consistent with what's known about the cell bio of the MHC class II antigen processing pathway. Um, and then if you add in viruses to these cells, what you see are in the control cells up top, you see maybe one, one little virion, so one bullet-shaped virus um, in the endosome, in the control cells, but you really don't see a lot of virus. It's very hard to find those viral particles in these cells. Um, but in C2TA overexpressing cells, which you, you can see clearly from the cutout, is that there are a ton of virus particles accumulated well within that multifascicular body, so in the inside of these endosomal compartments. Um, and then what you also see is if we overexpress either P if we overexpress P33, we don't see any viruses accumulate, even though we see these large vacuoles. Um, occur, we don't see virus in them. But if we express P41, which is that isoform of CD74 that 
does inhibit, we see virus accumulate in those. Um, and this holds true when we actually sit down and quantify, so count the number of virions per cell. We see an increase in the number of virions per cell in P41 expressing cells. And then if we also count the number of virions per endosome, we see an increase in the number of virions in the endosomes in P41 expressing cells. Um, so remember everything up to this point was done in U2OS cells, which are osteosarcoma cells. Um, they were a great cell model, but they're not really the primary site of infection during Ebola virus infection. So the first cells to get infected um, when an organism is infected with Ebola are thought to be the macrophages and the dendritic cells, mostly because those cells are sitting there and eating everything that they can come across, right? And they also have a lot of those endosomal dependent pathways so that a lot of endosomal compartments for the entry process to occur in. So the question then was, what's the physiological relevance in these primary cells that are the initial sites of infection during Ebola virus entry? And, you know, often antigen presenting cells like macrophages and DCs are thought of as expressing a lot of MHC class two, right? So, so we wanted to really kind of try and take a look at primary um, cells to see what was going on in this context. Um, uh, of sites that might be initial sites of infection for the virus, right? Um, so we wanted to ask if C2TA and CD74 are also able to inhibit entry in antigen presenting cells. So what we did was we took mice that were either controlled or had C2TA or CD74 knocked out. Um, and we took the bone marrow from those mice. We collected the bone marrow and we differentiated it into macrophage-like cells. So we added MCSF to those bone marrow cells. Um, and then we either primed or did not prime um, with interferon gamma and LPS. So we either added interferon gamma and LPS or we didn't add it. And that just uh, differentiates those macrophages into a more inflammatory like macrophage. Um, and so what we see is in these bone marrow derived macrophages, if you don't differentiate with interferon gamma and LPS, you see low levels of C2TA expression um, and also low levels of CD74 expression. But once you differentiate uh, or, or once you um, prime with interferon gamma and LPS into an inflammatory like state, you see high levels of C2TA expression and high levels of um, CD74 in wild type cells. However, once you have, if you have knockout cells that are knocked out for C2TA, you do not see that increase in um, expression of CD74 upon stimulation because C2TA is not present to actually lead to the upregulation of CD74. Um, so we really have to have that stimulated state to be able to, to see CD74 or C2TA expression. And what we then do is we take those cells that we've primed and we load them with Ebola virus-like particles or VLPs that express beta-lactamase. Um, and this is just an enzyme that allows us to use a fluorescence, um, a fluorescence fret assay that basically allows us to sort the cells into cells that have been entered into and those that have not. So it changes the fluoret changes the fluorescent state of the dye CCF2 that's loaded into these cells. So they turn blue if entry has occurred, um, or they maintain remain green if no entry has happened. Um, and then we take those cells and we uh, do flow analysis and look um, to see what percentage of cells have entered or how much BLAM activity has occurred. So in our C2TA cells um, that are unstimulated, so these are non-inflammatory, like these are just differentiated into macrophages, um, we see similar levels of infection in both wild type and C2TA knockout cells. Um, and we see, you know, decent levels of, of BLAM activity. If we then stimulate those cells, we see a decrease in the entry, in the amount of entry that's occurring in those stimulated cells. But if we knock out C2TA or CD74 in those cells, we don't see that decrease in um, infection. So we see that the, the 
in these cells when they are stimulated with interferon gamma and LPS, C2TA and CD74 are both leading to an increase in um, vir or, or a decrease in virus entry, which once you knock out those, you see an increase in virus entry. Um, so this really indicated to us that this is actually indeed that C2TA and CD74 restrict injury into inflammatory-like macrophages. So the next question we had was, what about the other APCs? So for dendritic cells, um, what's happening there? So we differentiated slightly using a slightly different mixture. So we use GMCSF, which differentiates into a mixture of macrophages and dendritic cells. And then we loaded them with BLAM and primed them just like we did before. And then we did a flow analysis to look and see if, if they got entered into. Um, and we sorted based on the presence or absence of MHC2 for macrophages versus DCs. And what we saw there was in the absence of CD74, so when CD74 is completely knocked out in these, um, in these um, macrophages and DCs, we see a, an increase in infection. Again, indicating that this is actually working in primary cells um, and the primary sites of infection. So how is this working? So just to summarize the model thus far, what we have are, um, so in normal cells, Ebola attaches to the surface, gets internalized, and then you have those cathepsins cleave back that glycoprotein that reveals the receptor binding site that then interacts with MPC1, and that leads to the molecular um, uh, fusion of the virus and host membrane and releases the genome and allows for replication to occur. Now, in our C2TA expressing cells, um, C2TA expression leads to the expression of CD74, um, and particularly that P41 isolation, isolate of CD74, which then gets transported to the late endosome lysosome, where that interacts with the cathepsins and binds the cathepsins um, by binding to that thyroglobulin domain. And that prevents the virus from then interacting with those cathepsins and the glycopro protein processing of, of the virus is blocked. And that way the virus cannot interact with its receptor and it no longer is able to fuse and you get accumulation of the virus into these late endosome um, and lysosomal compartments and you get inhibition of subsequent viral infection. Um, so importantly, a CD74 P41 restricts virus independent of its role in adaptive immunity. So remember all of this is happening in tissue culture plates. This is not happening in a living organism. So there is no adaptive immune response, right? So this is all innate immunity that's, that's happening and resisting the virus infection. Um, so the next logical question we had was, okay, this, this, we've seen this for Ebola, but does this extend to other viruses, right? Are there other viruses that this also inhibits or is this just like a special Ebola thing, right? Um, and it just so happened that, you know, it was the end, like I was putting the paper together and it just so happened that a SARS-like coronavirus kind of burst into the scene. So a lot of you guys will be familiar with this if you've been following the literature at all. So SARS coronavirus binds to ACE2, its receptor on the surface of the cell. And then it, um, after binding to ACE2, there's a structural rearrangement that happens that reveals a protease binding site or a protease cleavage site. That cleavage then occurs and it releases the fusion peptide that then allows for the virus and host uh, protein membrane or virus and host membranes to fuse and release the genomic um, payload into the cytoplasm and for the uh, infection to uh, finish or to progress. Um, there is also, so SARS-CoV-2 is also able to enter via a secondary mechanism that instead of having a cell surface protease like Tempris 2 cleave the virus from the cell surface, it's actually able to get endocytosed after engagement with the, the ACE2 receptor. And that leads to endocytosis and then interaction with cathepsin L, which also provides that, that cleavage event that is important for fusion. So you can either have the cleavage event happen from the cell surface or from, um, from the endosomal compartment. 
Um, so a prediction of this would be that if we have cells that um, where the virus enters solely from that endosomal compartment, so they don't have any cell surface proteases, they only have cathepsin L that's able to mediate that protease um, cleavage event, um, then expressing uh, P41 would be able to inhibit this virus, right? during infection. And so I just so happened to have started at Case Western at the time um, and had access to their BSL-3. So I was actually able to do this with native SARS-CoV-2. Um, and what we saw when we used Vero E6 cells, which are known to use that endosomal uh, protease dependent pathway, that if we expressed P41, we were able to see a complete inhibition of uh, plaque forming units um, in P41 expressing cells. And you could see that here in the bar graph, right? This is just a quantitation, quanti quantification of the, um, of the plaque assay shown on the right hand side in the purple. Um, so in P41 cells, you see a completely intact monolayer, um, whereas in control and P33 cells, you can see that the virus has spread and killed adjacent cells. Um, so really P41 is inhibiting this, uh, the virus when it enters via a low pH um, endosomal compartment dependent protease step. Um, but the next logical question we had was, okay, so it can inhibit uh, SARS-CoV-2 if it's entering via this low pH compartment, um, but what happens when it enters from the cell surface? So if we are able to express Tempris-2, do we bypass the ability of P41 to restrict SARS-CoV-2 virus infection? And indeed, what we see, so in order to do this experiment, we used 293T cells, which we engineered to express ACE2. When they express ACE2, you can see that they go from being non-permissive to SARS-CoV-2 infection to having um, a titer of 10 to the fourth, right? Um, and the TCID50 is just a tissue culture infectious dose 50, and that's just another way to titer the virus. Um, so to look for virus growth on these cells. Um, so when you add P41, so if you have ACE2 expressed and P41 expressed, we see a two log reduction in the virus titers. Um, if you have ACE2 expressed and you add Tempris2, you see a two log increase in the virus titer compared to just ACE2 expressing cells. So you see an increase in the ability of the virus to enter the cells. But if you add P41 to those cells, you do not see any inhibition of the ability of the virus to enter those cells. So really this indicates to us that Tempris-2 um, entry from the cell surface via a cell surface protease like Tempris-2 is able to bypass the P41 restriction of SARS-CoV-2. So if you can push the virus, if the virus starts entering from the cell surface, then this um, restriction mechanism can no longer inhibit the virus. Um, so that's important for SARS-CoV-2, right, because we're only inhibiting one of these two possible entry pathways. Um, so it's possible that SARS-CoV-2 developed also this cell surface protease um, cleavage uh, dependent pathway to be able to kind of bypass any endosomal inhibition, right? Um, so hopefully I've... Um, convinced you guys. So in summary, hopefully I've convinced you guys that transposon mutagenesis is a powerful screening tool to identify host virus interactions. Um, and we were able to identify a novel host virus interaction that we didn't previously appreciate. We uncovered a restriction mechanism that is used by a commonly exploited viral entry pathway. So it's not just Ebola and SARS-CoV-2 that use this, use cathepsins um, for, for virus entry and replication. A lot of other viruses use this pathway as well. So th I think that this is a more common or a, a more generalized um, inhibition pathway than we might have initially thought, right? And then CD74 and C2TA are very well-known proteins and they have been extensively studied. But in doing the screening process, we were able to describe a previously unknown aspect of their biology that we never would have kind of put the pieces together um, 
with without having the screen point us in that direction, right? Um, and you know, we were able to describe a um, largely a innate immune mechanism for these uh, two proteins, CD74 and CTTA. They were originally thought to only really be involved in adaptive immunity. So this is a really exciting kind of vignette into how you can discover some of these um, things using unbiased for our genetic screens that, that might surprise you ultimately in the end. Um, and I'd like to really take this time remaining to thank all of the people that made this work possible. Uh, this is really fun and exciting work to do. And I'd like to thank Adam and Linda for letting me join their lab and learn the screening technology, which is paid for it, uh, paid for itself in returns. I also would like to thank Keith Shaw, who was a co-author on this publication with me and did a lot of the bioinformatic analysis, um, and a lot of the other people at the Benaroya Research Institute that helped me during my postdoc. Um, and then I'd also like to thank the people at Case Western Reserve that have joined me and helped me out since I moved to Case Western and really started my independent faculty uh, career there, um, at, including the people that do the SARS-CoV-2 work with me in the BSL-3, Michelle, Steve, and Vinny, and then also the team that's been helping me follow up on some Ebola, some other Ebola hits that I hope to be able to talk about soon. Um, and Kenny Matreik, who's been a consummate collaborator and has helped me out with all sorts of things. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me and I'm happy to take any questions.